Three dots, three dashes, three dots. Even if you don't know a single other letter of Morse code, chances are you immediately recognize the unmistakable rhythm of SOS. It is the universal distress signal, understood in nearly every country and language, and appearing everywhere in pop culture, including songs by artists as diverse as ABBA, Rihanna, and Great Big C. And with good reason. Endlessly versatile SOS can be tapped out on a telegraph key or spoken aloud over voice radio, flashed using a signal mirror or flashlight, written out in the snow or sands, or if you happen to be under duress, blinked out with your eyelids. But how did this seemingly random string of letters come to be the universal code for hitting the fan, and do the letters actually mean anything? Well, tune your radio transmitters, warm up your signaling fingers, let's find out, shall we? Prior to the invention of radio, ships at sea relied on a combination of flags, lanterns, and signal flares to communicate with each other and the shore. However, these methods were only effective when the sender and receiver were within visual range of each other, meaning that in an emergency, the odds of a ship farther out at sea receiving help in time were slim to none. Unsurprisingly, when practical wireless telegraphy was finally developed by Italian inventor Marconi in the late 19th century, navies and shipping lines around the world were quick to adopt the new technology. Indeed, the first ship to shore wireless transmission took place all the way back in 1899 when lightship number 70 floating off the california coast near san francisco signaled the arrival of the troop ship usat sherman with the terse but historic words sherman is sighted this was followed shortly thereafter by the first marine wireless distress signal sent by the East Goodwin lightship when it ran aground in the English Channel on March 17, 1899. Three years later, the first private ship to shore wireless message, a birthday greeting to Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Joseph, was transmitted by the Cunard liner RMS Slavonia, which was carrying the Hungarian delegation of the Hague Peace Commission from America. With the ship's regular wireless operator indisposed, the signal was instead sent by Medora Olive Newell, an experienced telegrapher who happened to be a passenger on the crossing. In doing so, Newell became the first woman to operate a shipboard wireless station. And, as we shall see, this was not the last time RMS Sylvonia would make maritime wireless history. But while wireless telegraphy revolutionized maritime communication practically overnight, in the early days there were no internationally agreed upon standards for sending distress calls and other standard signals with every country and shipping line using its own set of codes. Indeed, the first American vessel to send a ship-to-shore distress signal, Nantucket Relief Lightship No. 58, on December 10, 1905, simply transmitted the word, HELP. The first attempt to create a universal distress signal was made by the Marconi International Marine Communications Company, which on January 7, 1904, issued Circular 57, announcing that for all the company's wireless installations, beginning on February 1, 1904, the call to be given by any ships in distress or in any way requiring assistance shall be CQD. It is often claimed that the letters CQD stand for Come Quick Distress, Come Quick Drowning, or Come Quickly down, but this is not the case. Then, as now, CQ was an internationally recognized procedural signal, or PRO sign, a standard combination of Morse code letters with no regular phonetic meaning, but which is understood to stand for a certain standard phrase. Some common PRO signs include R for Roger, or understood, K for over, or end of transmission, DE for this is from, and AA for unknown station. CQ, meanwhile, stands for calling all stations, a general alert to all ships and land stations in the area. On December 7, 1903, the International Merc Mercantile Marine Liner SS Kroonland lost a propeller off the Irish coast, prompting wireless operator Ludwig Arnsen to signal for help. Combining the existing pro sign CQ with D for distress, Arnsen created the new pro sign CQD standing for Calling All Stations Distress. A British cruiser soon arrived and towed the Kroonland to safety. For his quick thinking, Arnsen received the Marconi Memorial Medal of Achievement, and within a year, the Marconi Company adopted CQD as its official standard distress signal. Due to the Marconi Company's global reach CQD quickly became the most popular marine distress signal worldwide, though it was far from universal. The US Navy, for instance, used the code NC based on the old International Code of Signals flag, meaning in distress want immediate assistance, while Italians used the repeating letter combination SSSDDD. The first use of CQD at sea came on January 3, 1909, when the White Star Liner RMS Republic collided with the Lloyd Italiano Liner SS Florida off the coast of Nantucket, Massachusetts. The collision instantly 
instantly killed two passengers sleeping in their cabins and caused the Republic to start taking on water. Thankfully, wireless operator Jack Binns was able to send a CQD distress signal to the nearby Nantucket Island station, which immediately dispatched the U.S. revenue cutter Gresham to the site of the collision. While the Republic eventually sank, its remaining passengers and crew were safely transferred aboard the Florida and the White Star liner RMS Baltic, which had also received Binns' distress call and steamed to the rescue. By this time, however, a new standard distress signal had appeared on the scene. Consisting of three dots, three dashes, and three dots again, the signal, originally called the not Zeichen, but more popularly known as SOS, originated in Germany as part of the 1905 regulations for the control of spark telegraphy. At the International Radio Telegraph Convention held in Berlin in 1906, representatives from the German Telefunk Organization and the British Marconi Society recommended that SOS be adopted internationally as a replacement for the older CQD C and SSS DDD codes. The motion passed, and on July 1, 1908, the convention issued a new set of service regulations, including Article 16, which dictated that ships in distress shall use the following signal, dot dot dot, dash dash dash, dot dot dot, repeated at brief intervals. It seems necessary to specify that indications concerning a state of distress should be given by means of conventional signals in order that they may be understood by all stations. The convention also established 500 kilohertz as the international calling and distress frequency, a standard that persisted for nearly a century. As with CQD, it is widely believed that SOS is an acronym standing for Save Our Souls or Save Our Ship, but just like CQD, this is not the case. As with the 1918 Marconi Yearbook of Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony explains, this signal was adopted simply on account of its easy radiation and its unmistakable character. There is no special significance in the letters themselves. Even the common name SOS for the signal was chosen merely out of convenience, as pro signs like SOS or CQD are not intended to be proper words. They are transmitted as solid blocks of Morse code symbols with no spaces between individual words. Thus, the combination dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 could just as easily be read as IWB, VZE, 3B, or V7. However, the human brain has a tendency to group similar adjacent objects together, a psychological phenomenon known as clumping, and SOS just happens to be the easiest letter combination to remember. Interestingly, in American Morse code, which predates the International Morse code by two decades, three dashes stands not for O but the number five, meaning that for many years the dot 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 dash 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 dot dot signal was informally known in the US as S5S. In addition to being easy to remember, SOS is also remarkably adaptable to forms of communication outside telegraphy. It's visually distinctive, and being an ambigram can be read both backwards, forwards, upside down, making it easy to spell out using makeshift materials, for example, using stick stones or lines drawn in the snow and sands. It's also sonically distinctive when said aloud, allowing a spoken SOS to easily cut through radio static. In English and several other languages, SOS has the further advantage of being a relatively rare letter combination in ordinary communications. This is not the case in every language, however, which is why standard radio procedures is to send several repeats of the SOS signal. That way, a Latin American or Philippine vessel casually wiring for more pesos won't accidentally trigger a rescue operation. Yet, despite its many advantages, SOS was slow to catch on as a universal distress signal, with many wireless operators clinging to CQD and other older codes for several more years. By remarkable coincidence, the first ship to use SOS in an emergency was our old friend RMS Slavonia, which had sent the first private ship to shore message in 1904. On June 10, 1909, seven days after departing New York, Slavonia ran into thick fog off Ponta dos Penas in the Azores and ran aground on a rocky shore. Her wireless operator promptly transmitted an SOS, and the liners SS Princess Irene and SS Batavia promptly arrived on the scene. Princess Irene took aboard 110 first and second class passengers, and Batavia 300 steerage class passengers, while the crew remained aboard, abandoning the ship the following day. The passengers and crew disembarked at Gibraltar and Naples, while the ship was declared a total loss, though some of her cargo, including 400 bags of coffee and 1,000 ingots of copper, were successfully salvaged from the wreck. Her captain was found responsible for the wreck and reprimanded for being severely off course and traveling too fast for the prevailing conditions. Two months later, on August the 11th, the American Clyde Line steamer SS Arapaho broke a propeller shaft and found itself drifting helplessly off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, a treacherous region known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. At first, the ship's wireless operator, Theodore Haubner, was confused as to whether to send the old CQD signal or the 
newly prescribed SOS. In the end, he sent both. His distress call was received by the United Wireless Telegraph Company station at Hatteras and forwarded to Clyde Line headquarters in New York City. Twelve hours later, the Arapo sister ship SS Iroquois arrived and safely towed her to Charleston, South Carolina. Hubner's signal was the first recorded use of an SOS by an American ship. The Arapaho's propeller shaft was swiftly repaired, and the ship returned to service in December of that year. On December 29th, while the Arapaho was steaming back to New York, Theodore Haubner intercepted another SOS signal. By a remarkable coincidence, it came from the Arapaho's former rescuer, SS Iroquois, which had broken its rudder and found itself adrift in the same treacherous waters as Arapaho just a few months earlier. However, Arapaho was not close enough to effect a rescue, and the task fell to the steamer SS San Marcos, which managed to navigate a fierce winter storm in order to tow the Iroquois to safety. On that day, Theodore Haubner gained the unique distinction of being the first person to both send and receive an SOS. However, it would take a much greater and more famous maritime disaster for SOS to truly catch on. When the White Star Liner RMS Titanic struck the iceberg on the 15th of April 1912 and began to sink, wireless operator Jack Phillips initially transmitted CQD. However, junior wireless operator Harold Bride suggested that he use SOS instead, pointing out in a bit of gallows humor that it might be their last chance to try out the new code. Phillips proceeded to alternate between the two signals, ultimately succeeding in contacting the Cunard liner RMS Carpathia. Phillips and Bride remained at their stations until 2 a.m. when the wireless battery had completely run out and the pair were relieved by Captain Edward Smith. While Bride managed to survive the sinking, Phillips went down with the ship. The media frenzy surrounding the sinking of the Titanic brought the new SOS signal to the attention of the wider public for the first time, and shortly thereafter, older codes like CQD were all but abandoned. On January 20, 1914, the London International Convention on Safety of Life at Sea officially adopted SOS as the standard international distress signal. The fourth international radio telegraph conference convened on October 4, 1927 in Washington, D.C., further establishing the safety signal TTT as a preamble for messages concerning the safety of navigation or containing meteorological warnings. The conference also standardized the use of Mayday, a distress signal for voice radio. The term, conceived by Stanley Mockford, the officer in charge of radio communications at Croydon Airport in London, was derived from the French Mayday, meaning help me. During the Second World War, a number of standard suffixes were developed that could be appended to an SOS signal to indicate the nature of the emergency. For example, SOS AAA indicated attack by aircraft, SOS RRR indicated attack by a surface vessel, and SOS SSS was attacked by a submarine. SOS Morse code and the 500 kHz band remained the standard means of signaling distress over the airwaves for nearly a century, with the iconic dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 signal group becoming an indelible fixture of global pop culture. But alas, in the world of technology, nothing is immune to the steady march of progress, and in 1993, the 38th session of the International Maritime Organization Subcommittee on Radio Communications and Search and Rescue was informed by the United States delegation that as of August the first of that year, the U.S. Coast Guard would no longer monitor the 500 kilohertz distress frequency and would cease all Morse code services. In the years that followed, many other maritime organizations around the globe follow suit, with the French Navy's final Morse code message being sent on January the 31st, 1997, reading, Calling all, this is our last cry, before eternal silence. The final official Morse code message in the United States was sent on July the 12th, 1999, and it was slightly less dramatic, repeating the very first words sent by Morse code telegraph on May the 24th, 1844. What hath God wrought? In place of Morse code infrastructure, the IMO established the Global Maritime Distress and Safety System, or GMDSS, a sophisticated satellite-based network that allows standardized automated distress signals and GPS location information to be transmitted from a stricken vessel without the need for special radio or Morse code training. Still, military organizations in several countries, including the U.S. Air Force, continue to train a small number of proficient Morse code operators just in case. 